sonatas. You can't escape them in classical music. You can't even escape them out in the real world, and for all I know, you might even drive one. But what exactly is a sonata? Well, it turns out the answer to that question goes far deeper than just the sonata form taught in theory classes. And we will cover that, but more importantly, we're going to be talking about why that form came to be, and why it's been the most influential form in the history of Western music. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about the sonata. <laughs> In the earliest days of the term, the word sonata simply meant a piece that was sounded. This would be an instrumental piece of some sort, and its etymology is intimately tied into other common forms of the era, such as cantata, meaning a piece that was sung. William S. Newman dedicated over 2,000 pages to the sonata in a three-volume set called The History of the Sonata Idea. He attempted a definition that would encompass everything called a sonata in the course of, in his time, about 350 years. I say attempt here not to denigrate Newman. I think he did a pretty laudable job under the circumstances, but in order to make such a long history with all these different movements and traditions within it fit one broad definition and have that definition make any sense, it has to be complicated. And this is what Newman came up with. The sonata is a solo or chamber instrumental cycle of aesthetic or diversional purpose consisting of several contrasting movements that are based on relatively extended designs in absolute music. Those are certainly all words. We have to break it up a little bit if we we're going to try to understand and parse through this definition, because it is helpful. Tomasz Schmidt-Beste, in his introduction to the sonata, did this for us, taking Newman's definition and slicing it up into six different criteria. Those criteria being one, a purely instrumental work, two, a limited number of players, one to a part, Three, it has to be not written for a specific function or purpose. Four, it has to have contrasting movements or sections within those movements. Five, relatively complex structure or form. And six, it has to be absolute music, which is to say not based on some kind of extra musical program or model or story. This criteria is not perfect, but it turns out to be a fantastic starting point. You're going to find sonatas that violate one or two of these principles as you go throughout history, but a majority of them are always going to be present. It's a definition that can include everything from Mozart to Brian Fernihau, which I think is pretty neat. So who wrote the earliest sonata? That's actually a really good question, and musicology has a solid guess, but no definitive answer. The word sonata in reference to instrumental music can be dated back to at least the 14th century. The title refers to instrumental music, not vocal music, with no further categorization beyond that. So in the Renaissance, it referred to instrumental music that was not derived in any way from vocal music. But since vocal music was such a huge part of composers' outputs, there weren't that many pieces which were even eligible to be called sonatas in the first place. By the late Renaissance, terms began to get muddied, especially when the canzona, a piece of vocal music, lost its association with the voice and became a purely instrumental form. So when canzona composers wanted to branch out, they exploited the similarity of the terms canzona, and their new definition, and the sonata. So possibly, possibly, the first pieces to be explicitly called sonatas come from a 1597 collection by Giovanni Gabrielli called Sacre Symphonie. Canzonas were lively and imitative pieces, with frequent changes of meter between sections. The new sonata definition was for pieces that were a little more stately. This is the first more specific definition, but it's hardly good for any composer not named Giovanni Gabrielli. 
After the Sacre Symphonie, he wrote a collection called Canzone et Sonate, where the sonatas are completely different. These feature a nearly continuous bass and a series of imitative upper voices. For the first broad definition of the sonata, it'd be pieces like these, much more hierarchical in their deference to the bass compared to those of his canzonas. This is something called the Stile Moderno and was cribbed from the vocal music of the composer Claudio Monteverdi, who had pioneered a new form of composition that was less concerned with counterpoint and more about maximizing expression of a text. Composers like Gabrielli moved that style into instrumental music. Splitting off very early in the history of the sonata, around the turn of the 17th century, is the organ sonata. These were simply collections of pieces that were used in church services. By the start of the 19th century, they stopped being played as part of the services themselves, although they were still typically played in church, if nothing else because that's where the, all the organs were. I mention this because pretty much everything I'm going to say here on out about the sonata has little to nothing to do with the organ sonata. It just kind of goes off in its own journey as a form before kind of fizzling out in the middle of the 20th century. The first multi-movement sonatas, emerging in the second half of the 1600s, came from Italy as well. Borrowed from dance suites, which would contain multiple movements under one umbrella, these sonatas came in two flavors, strongly codified by Arcangelo Corelli, sonatas da camera and sonatas da chiesa, that is chamber sonatas and church sonatas respectively. The Italian sonata da camera soon became indistinguishable from the French dance suite, as Rousseau pointed out, writing in the 1760s. The same music, depending on where on the continent it was written, could be called any number of different things, which is one of these things that makes Baroque musicology just interminably frustrating. Sonatas da camera were, as Rousseau implied, sonatas that were made up of dance music, but these were not dance forms to be danced to. They were abstractions of dances intended for listening pleasure, not for moving your body around. Sonatas da Chiesa, on the other hand, would alternate slow and fast movements, and they wouldn't have dance titles. They just have tempo markings. Oh, and by the way, da camera, da Chiesa, that means nothing about where these pieces would actually be performed. It's not like the da Chiesa had to be done in churches. It's another common misconception stemming from frankly, a really silly name. It's really dangerous to say that any one person invented the sonata, but if you forced me to make a decision, I'd probably say that it was Arcangelo Corelli, because he gave the form more life and depth than it had ever had before. When you wrote a sonata after Corelli, the expectation was that you were writing music in this particular form and mold, and he did it in just 60 pieces, five sets of 12 published in his lifetime. Corelli codified the standard of the trio sonata, so named not after the number of instruments, but the number of individual parts. It's very common for an ensemble of four players to play a trio sonata, two melody instruments, a monophonic bass instrument, and a polyphonic instrument to fill out the harmony. Trio sonatas can be played on as little as one instrument. See Bach, Johann Sebastian. Two more things have to happen before we can get to talking about sonata form. For one, maybe you've noticed this so far, we haven't actually talked about keyboard music at all, and most pieces today that we think of as sonatas at least contain a piano, or they're just for the piano and no other instrument. To be fair, the piano hadn't been invented by the time the Baroque era first started, it had been invented by the time it ended, but keyboards were still around. But if you're writing a harpsichord piece around 1650, 1670, you weren't going to call it a sonata. You were going to call it probably a toccata, a piece that was touched. Around 1700, you start to see more sonatas being written, and by 1750, the sonata became the primary vehicle for keyboard music as opposed to the toccata. The toccata was still around, mind you, and it still means something even today, but it means something more specific than just a piece that was touched to be sounded. Lodovico Giustini, a minor figure today, holds the distinction of writing the first music written specifically for the piano, and these pieces, published in 1732, were called sonatas. 
Whilst Nata's da Camera and da Chiesa gave you a sense of how the different movements would shake out in terms of their quality and their tempos vis-a-vis -vis one another, the form of any one given movement was likely to be in some variation on binary form, a quintessential two-part structure that would serve as the seed of what we today call sonata form. And the king of binary form was none other than the prolific keyboard sonata composer Domenico Scarlatti, whose life story and magnificently satisfying total of 555 keyboard sonatas I have covered in a previous video. The standard Scarlatti sonata is in one movement, it's in binary form, and probably has some interesting modulations and or evocations of other instruments thrown in. Well, the famous ones do anyway. With that many sonatas, to quote Keenan Thompson, They're not all gonna be winners! Scarlatti and Joseph Haydn after him were both forced into prolific originality, in part because they worked for royal courts which were further removed from the happening places of the European cultural scene. The sonata, by the later part of the 1700s, had gained favor as a perfect middle ground, something that could appeal to educated listeners as well as to amateur music lovers. Italian composers dominated the sonata scene, which makes sense given it's an Italian word, but soon it began creeping north, all the way up to modern-day Germany. Composers there experimented with different structures, none more wildly than Johann Kuhnau's biblical sonatas from 1700, which dispensed with movements in favor of a series of scenes that mirror whatever scriptural passage he was pulling from, and are accompanied by written commentaries on the action that the music depicts. More explicit representation was also found in Heinrich Bieber's work, with his Sonata Violino Sola Representativa, which imitates a whole series of animals, but these are exceptions to the role of sonatas being a form of absolute music that didn't attempt to depict or represent anything in particular. This is what confused France through the huge chunk of the 18th century. Rousseau summed up French attitudes toward the sonata, calling it unnatural to write abstract music that could not be classified by its function. When sonatas first appeared in France, they were harpsichord pieces with violin accompaniment, not violin pieces with harpsichord accompaniment like we might think of today. And this was inverted from the usual paradigm because that's how harpsichord pieces got played. You would play a harpsichord piece and then if it was fitting for the instrument you had lying around, and any melody instrument, you'd just have somebody else pick that up and they'd play along whatever the top line happened to be. This was just a codification of an existing performance practice, which strikes me still as kind of a strange thing to do, but we got a violin laying around, you might as well use it. 1750 comes up a whole lot in music history texts as the end of the Baroque era. Major stylistic shifts that were happening in and around that time, give or take a decade, are generally pinned onto 1750 if you have to pick a date. Because it's a nice kind of roundish number, and also Johann Sebastian Bach died that year. The sonata too undergoes a shift as the classical era gets underway. The whole da chiesa, da camera thing gets dropped, the practice of specifying how many instruments it's for, or how many voices I should say, the a tre for the trio sonata, a quattro for a sonata for four parts, that's totally annihilated as well. Composers now rarely wrote sonatas for anything other than one or two instruments, and the form moved from the private sphere of the rich and powerful fully into public performance, and there it changed. Audiences of the early classical era wanted music that was both intellectually engaging, but which reigned in the sometimes wonky harmonic rhythms of the Baroque era, and also included more regular phrase structures. Scarlatti, although he was a Baroque composer by looking at his birth and death dates, he blurs the line here because he's so influential in the development of the classical sonata. But as mentioned, he wrote in binary form. So first we have to understand a little bit how binary form works. Binary form is one of these catch-all terms that refers to any piece that exists in two major sections, A and B. And typically there is a repeat in here, so you have either A or B repeated or both. These repeats are universal in binary form because they're necessary. If you didn't have any repeats, the music would just be A, B, and you might as well just call it A, if there's no way to distinguish between one section and another section. This need to make it clear what was or wasn't a section of the music led to the development of rounded binary form, where part of A was tacked onto the end to round out the form. You hear a return to A and you think, oh, that must have been B that I was hearing. Students sometimes have an understandably difficult time differentiating rounded binary from a similar three-part structure called ternary. But both originate from the same impulse, how to create a satisfying self-contained form using only two large sections of contrasting material. By 1750, the careers of composers of the early classical era were already well underway, and the sonata was a primary vehicle for their music. 
They wrote them for themselves to play, they wrote them for an ever-growing market of amateurs, and it was not uncommon in an era of incredibly prolific composition to see one composer write dozens, if not hundreds, of sonatas. You may have noticed that I've been talking about sonata form in quotes throughout the course of this thing so far, and the reason is that, from a musicological perspective, it's hard to argue that sonata form existed in the way that we tend to think of it as existing. Haydn, Mozart, these composers were not working in what they thought of as sonata form. The term just did not exist. It was an ex post facto musicological term that was used to describe the first movement forms of classical era sonatas, as well as symphonies and string quartets, and when modified concerti. In the interests of not inclusivity, but sheer accuracy, you might be tempted to call it first movement form, but even that becomes problematic. Because it wasn't just used for first movements. It was most common in first movements, but you have first movements that aren't in sonata form. You have middle movements and finales that are in sonata form. This is part of the reason why Charles Rosen believed that a better term would be sonata forms, to account for the variety that sonatas contain. Now, I want to be very clear. The sonata form taught in music theory classes, and which we're going to go in-depth on later in this video, is not inaccurate. It is highly accurate. I just have a little bit of a peeve with how it's taught. Because it's taught in a way that makes it seem like it's some mold waiting to be filled with music. Not as an organic form that emerged out of Baroque binary forms, fused with the aesthetic sensibilities of the classical era. There is some utility to that oversimplification, but it's still not how the performers or composers of the time would have heard the piece. If we think of sonata form as this grandiose thing, this perfect mold into which music is poured, it forces our listening into this one-track mind where we're just keeping track of something like a road exercise. And it turns composition assignments into nothing more than what mountains you can make in somebody else's sandbox. So when you hear sonata form, just know that it is not how composers who wrote the examples that you're probably looking at understood the music that they were writing. However, it's still very accurate to describe what's happening in the pieces that are called sonata form. Theorists first identified sonata form in the 1820s, but its first full exploration in print had to wait until 1845 when Adolf Marx concluded his three-volume study of musical composition with a description of sonata form, derived from an analysis of Beethoven's music. While Marx's analysis holds up, his adoration of Beethoven hinders rather than helps him. He writes of the form as though it were the pinnacle of all musical creation, beyond which nothing more perfect could possibly be conceived. When he says that sonatas have powerful, strident first themes and lyrical, pleasant second themes, you can kind of tell he's thinking about his boy Letty Van B. And he notes from the very beginning, from the outset of the term, a potential spot of confusion that has been with us ever since. The fact that sonata form sounds like it refers to the whole piece, the whole three, four, how many movements you got, when really it just refers to the first movement form common to sonatas. Literally a problem since the very beginning. You'd think they would have fixed this earlier, but now we're stuck with it. Sonata form, as commonly understood, is an outgrowth of Baroque binary form fused with the sensibilities and aesthetics of the classical era. Since the time of Corelli, sonatas had steadily grown longer in terms of the number of measures that they contained. There were more of them than ever, and imitative counterpoint as a method for sustaining listeners' interest was just out of fashion. So you had to find some way of making your pieces longer while still maintaining listeners' interest in a way that fit with the desires of the listening public of the time. The A section became the exposition, which featured two or more contrasting themes in two contrasting key areas. In major, you would begin on one and move to five. In minor, you begin on one and move to three. This is then repeated. The B section became the development, but instead of introducing new material as had been common in the Baroque, it was now the opportunity to show off what you did with the materials you had previously introduced. A prime became the recapitulation, where the exposition comes back with a twist. Instead of modulating to a second key area, it was now rewritten so as to not modulate. So you have all of your themes, but in the same home key. Within this framework, composers were not nearly as interested in the number of themes that their sonatas contained, but rather within the tonal architecture. Musical interest was sustained over longer periods of time through the use of different key areas. So it makes sense that sonatas would make their cadences into their new keys 
as dramatically important and structurally important as possible. So the idea of first theme and second theme, they're useful for individual sonatas, but they do not always line up with where the different key areas are. Haydn was all about economy and he preferred monothematic expositions where there is just one theme. Mozart, on the other hand, sometimes uses a plethora of themes, unfolding at a completely different rate than the primary and secondary key areas. The exposition comes in more than just two parts. First, the home key is introduced with the first theme. Second, usually there's a modulatory bridge, either varying the first theme or introducing new material. ending on a cadence and then usually at least a short pause, called the medial sejura, so that the third section, the introduction of material in our secondary key, can sound like a fresh start. Charles Rosen noted this tendency to highlight an arrival in the secondary key. That modulation wasn't just required, it had to be relished and celebrated. The optional fourth part continues and elaborates upon this secondary key area. ending in a fifth section known today as the essential expositional closure. The odd-numbered sections are the ones that are always present. The even-numbered ones are typically absent, elided, or condensed in shorter sonatas. Again, these sections are not defined by the presence of a particular theme. They're defined by their key areas, charting a move from tonic slowly into the secondary area, then meticulously confirming that secondary key before final cadence in it. Then the whole thing is repeated. Development sections, by their very nature, are more complicated, and their structure comes more as a list of tendencies, stating a theme from the exposition, possibly starting with the first theme, but then the secondary key. You could elaborate fragments of exposition themes, you could play around with stock figurations like scales and arpeggios, and as much as theorists may be pained to admit it, sometimes there's new material entirely. Developments also play around with key areas much looser than expositions or recapitulations often beginning in one of the keys from the exposition and working into a more distant key, a kind of point of furthest tonal remove. From there, the tonal pattern unwinds back to the tonic. Typically there's a cadence in some tertiary key, the 3 or the 6 chord in major for instance. Contemporary analysis sees this as the end of the development part of the development. The remaining music in this section is called the retransition. It dramatically takes us from this tertiary key all the way back to the dominant, often elaborated by using material that we've heard before. Mm -hmm. 
The recapitulation begins not with the first theme, but with tonic, typically speaking. Composers liked playing around with expectations. They could change the theme used, include a false recap in their developments, sneak into the recap to subvert the expected 5-1, or, especially effective in monothematic sonatas, begin not on 1, but on 4. The advantage there being you wouldn't have to recompose anything. The expositions move to the dominant, becomes the recaps move back into the tonic. Even when the recapitulation is entirely in the tonic, when composers rework their transition sections, they would often modulate briefly to four along the way. And then there's an optional coda at the end for extra tonic if the composer felt like their recapitulation had too much modulation. Up until around 1800, it was common to repeat the exposition section, but also to repeat the development and recapitulation sections as an entire block. Beethoven changed this. Having grown up with the music of Haydn and earlier classicists, he was in a position to fully explore all the frameworks that they'd set up, mostly by pushing on the edges. Development became something that was no longer confined to just the development section. Key relationships now emphasize thirds instead of fifths. Theretofore formally unimportant slow introductions, which would usually, if they existed at all, be a thing that happens at the beginning and then not anywhere else to the rest of the piece, now can recur and return at formally important junctures. And the coda in Beethoven expands to such large proportions that some analysts have suggested that the coda in Beethoven sometimes acts as a second development section. I think that's going a little bit too far. But it does explain something about how Beethoven ends a lot of his pieces. Beethoven sometimes gets dunked on, especially in his symphonies, for going 5-1-5-1-5-1-5-1 a bunch at the end. But there's a reason he might do this to balance out sonata form. Because if he's doing a lot of development, his oversized development sections, and he's expanding the number of keys and the relationships between them, there's a reason that he might want to spend a little more time at the end reinforcing cadencing constantly, constantly in the tonic just for the sake of balance. The complexity of the sonata has invited theorists over the years to come up with a kind of sonata theory of everything. Edward T. Cohn had an interesting idea, and he said, instead of calling it sonata form, we should call it the sonata principle instead. The principle being, when you bring things back in the recapitulation, the themes are all in the same key. Adolf Marx embraced the philosophy of Hegelian dialectics, a greater whole which is formed from a synthesis of competing ideas. Thus, his starting point from the outset falls victim to this fallacy of saying that theme one 
is in key A and theme two is in key B, and there's a direct correlation between theme and key, which is usually present, but not always. Sonata form is a tonal process and not a thematic one. Where the themes go is much less important than what keys they articulate along the way. One of the biggest landmarks in modern sonata analysis is the brainchild of James Hepikoski and Warren Darcy, whose book Elements of Sonata Theory is a thorough investigation of the literature and the best attempt to date at crafting a sonata theory of everything. They embrace Rosen's idea of sonata forms while still finding room for Cohn's idea that the sonata is a principle. Much of the newer terminology in the field comes from their work. The terms medial caesura and essential expositional closure that I used earlier, those are terms from Hepikoski and Darcy. They propose that sonata form is a series of typical choices made at particular junctures within the form. Composers default to more common avenues when they get to these areas, and there are different levels. There's a first level default, which is the most common thing. Second level default is still used, just not as common, and then so on. If you choose to do something completely original, that's called a deformation. Form for Hepikoski resides more properly in the composer and listener activated process of measuring what one hears against what one is invited to expect. Their work is the cumulative effort of many years of studying and teaching, and is a reaction against what they see as a rigid understanding of sonata form as offered by previous textbooks. Sonatas of the 18th century work because they are in dialogue with other sonatas of the time, which create different levels of expectation depending on how frequently a composer chooses to do this, that, or the other thing. Sonata theory is a hefty book because it has to reconstruct the stylistic norms of several centuries ago. The essence of sonata theory, they write, lies in uncovering and interpreting the dialogue of an individual piece with the background set of norms. Sonata theory is, I think, the best way to analyze a sonata because it allows for a lot of variation while still being a very solid and very coherent theory. It's sort of like a series of branching paths through the woods. You start in one place and you end up in another place, but along the way the paths will fork and shift and you get to decide which one you're going to follow. Or maybe you're going to strike out where there is no path at all and rejoin the path a little bit later. At every potential juncture in the form, the composer is as though they're on that path through the woods. You have to figure out what to do, which path to follow, what choices you're going to make. The downside is that it comes with a lot of new terminology and a lot of abbreviations and a lot of jargon, and it borrows some very important terms from literary criticism. Not to insult lit crit, but terms like rotation and deformation, maybe they're just not as intuitive as they could be. We are trying to sketch the outlines of a complex set of common options or generic defaults, they write. Yes, the book is very dense, but it is essential reading for anyone looking to stay abreast of contemporary sonata analysis. Other texts use it as a jumping off point. For instance, Andrew Davis's Sonata Fragments. This takes the terminology of sonata theory and applies that as a baseline for looking at sonatas of the Romantic era. You wouldn't be able to understand this book if you didn't have knowledge of sonata theory. We have to keep in mind that this discussion centers around the typical first movement design of a classical sonata. And the sonata had been a multi-movement form since before the turn of the 18th century. The da camera and da chiesa sonatas were invariably in four movements. Sonatas da chiesa were slow, fast, slow, fast, often with the slow movements flowing uninterrupted into the fast movements that followed them. After the demise of this format, the sonata became often fast, slow, fast, and occasionally you would find two movement sonatas which would be fast and even faster. The three movement fast, slow, fast won out, and that became the standard classical model, but it was far from universal. Adolf Marx regarded the three movement sonata as the essential sonata, if you will. A second middle movement, to his mind, neither helped nor hindered what was basically a three movement structure. Both Marx and Hugo Riemann believed that the three movement superstructure mirrored the exposition development recapitulation paradigm of sonata form. Put a pin in that, because that's going to get important later. It's also helpful to compare the sonata to the genres that emerged in the classical era, which often used sonata form, or a variation thereof, for their first movements. Symphonies and string quartets, which often had four movements, and sonatas and concertos, which typically had three. The extra movement in the symphony and the string quartet was typically the third movement, interpolated in there, and it's usually a minuet and trio, 
the last holdout from the dance music but not for dancing that we see in the old Sonata da Camera. It was not until the last few decades of the classical era, spearheaded by the works of Beethoven, that sonata composers began to think bigger, a little bit more symphonically, augmented by advancements in the size and resonance of the piano, which was a primary vehicle for sonatas. The second movement would typically be a slow movement, and the third, when it finally crops up, is at first that same minuet and trio. Although Haydn originated the term scherzo, which means joke in a musical context, Beethoven popularized and standardized it in both his symphonies and his sonatas, replacing that last dance holdout with something a little bit more relevant to his time. The finale was a different story entirely, and it proved a little problematic because composers had to do for the full sonata what the recapitulation had done for your first movement. It had to be weighty and it had to be exciting. So composers typically saved their flashiest material and their fastest speeds for the finale. They went a little bit lighter on the development and they reinforced a lot of the tonic. When they went to a secondary key area, it would typically be four, much like the recapitulations from the first movement. The archetypal choice of form in the finale is the rondo, which alternates an A section in the tonic with episodes of contrasting material. Sometimes finales would also be in sonata form, but the most fascinating examples of finales fuse these two into something called sonata rondo form. Sonata rondo form maps the three-part sonata structure onto the seven-part rondo. ABA becomes the exposition, C is the development, the final ABA, the recapitulation. Sonata rondo movements can be tricky to analyze, but a good rule of thumb is to focus on C. In a rondo, this section is going to be entirely new material, but in a sonata rondo, it's going to have to have the characteristics of a development. This was the preferred choice of Beethoven until pretty late in his career, when he began writing sets of variations, or big fugues, to round off his sonatas, lending appropriate gravitas to final movements without relying on flashy, fast music in a well-explored form. Tonality over the course of several movements didn't get standardized either. In most Baroque suites, all movements are in the same key. So in the latter decades of that era, where you start to see composers experiment with putting a middle movement in four or in a relative or parallel minor. Haydn and Mozart, for their major mode sonatas, preferred four for their middle movements. And the same impulse is the reason that you have four as a common key area visited in the recapitulations of first movements as well as in finales. You're ratcheting down the circle of fifths to compensate for the movement up the circle of fifths, going from one to five in major mode expositions. Of course, by the time you get to Beethoven, this probably goes without saying at this point, he blows it all up. The kind of third base relationships he was exploring within his movements also affect the relationships of keys between movements. By the time we reach late Beethoven, sonata form had been greatly twisted. This is where we see a consistent exploration of how the movements of sonatas were structured, and as well as how many of them there were. On the one hand, you have his massive Hammerklavier sonata, which was in the standard four movements, but huge in scope and considered technically unplayable until Franz Liszt premiered it almost two decades after its composition. For a long time, sonatas rarely ventured into virtuosity for virtuosity's sake. Virtuoso performers jealously guarded their own trade secrets because they got most of their money from performing, not from publishing their pieces. And besides, there was already a genre which indulged in instrumental virtuosity and fireworks for their own sake. It was generally called a fantasia if you were going to do that. You're not going to call the piece a sonata. But as the sonata began to break down, the sonata fantasia line blurred. You could have sonatas that were both technical showpieces as well as exemplars of formal mastery. Beethoven's final sonata, by comparison, is a slim two movements. This might be the hardest number of movements to write as a composer because it's very easy to make a two movement piece sound lopsided or incomplete. Decisions like that, and more importantly, Beethoven's ability to pull it off once he decides to do it is one of the reasons that we think of the Romantic era as beginning somewhere around the latter half or third of Beethoven's career. Different scholars are going to give you different dates if they are forced to pick one. Formal structures became clouded. There were more unusual key relationships. There was no double bar marking the end of the exposition and the beginning of the development. There was all sorts of structural and thematic trickery afoot. It's not just that Beethoven was some kind of monumental genius. I mean, he was, but that's really not the point I'm trying to make here. He had the added benefit of having grown up with sonata form as we know it. He grew up with Haydn, he grew up with Mozart. He grew up knowing what should happen in these pieces, so he could delight in subverting those expectations in novel ways. 
Had recording technology been around, this probably would have happened sooner because audiences would have gotten accustomed to the tropes of the genre faster. But the subversions that Beethoven offers us, they work. Like, they make sense. It's not like The Last Jedi or something. The sonata became a battle between the forward momentum of classical era aesthetics with the freer and more poetic discourse of the Romantic era. When discussing the aesthetics of the Romantic sonata in Sonata Fragments, Andrew Davis says, Musical acronyms are particularly important features of the Romantic Sonata, in which they often take the form of modules interpolated, perhaps illogically or otherwise problematically, into the structure that appear to immobilize, suppress, arrest, or suspend the generically obligatory forward-vectored progress through the first narrative stream. In many cases, such interpolations can be interpreted as musically analogous to narrative detours. This opposition of temporal and atemporal streams is one of the chief concerns, one of the foremost genre-defining features of Romantic music and specifically of the sonata in the Romantic era. The Romantic era sonata is still concerned with key relationships, but it's not the only binary oppositional force present in Davis's analysis. In the Romantic sonata form, Davis says, this central opposition is often situated as a conflict specifically between a primary theme signifying the present or reality and a secondary theme signifying something non-present, unreal, or unattainable. Beethoven looms large today, but larger still was his presence over those who had to put together the pieces of the tradition that he left in his wake. No composer in the immediate post-Beethovenian generation was writing the kind of mammoth symphonies and monumental piano sonatas and epic string quartets that Beethoven was doing on a regular basis. So early Romanticism tended to focus on things that Beethoven didn't do so much of, song cycles, character pieces, programmatic music. This is part of what's sometimes called the crisis of form. I like to think of it as a Beethoven-shaped hole in the wall, and other composers had to figure out how to fill it up. Sonatas were old-fashioned in this new paradigm, but they weren't useless. Beethoven had so thoroughly explored the genre that they became, to composers and critics like Robert Schumann, tests of a budding composer's competence, and the best way for a young composer to introduce themselves to the world but not exactly the genre in which one would make or break one's career. And this is borne out by analysis of the literature. Sonatas per composer, even the most prolific composers, dwindled down to the single digits. And when composers did write sonatas, they tended to be these massive works of epic scope. In the 19th century, sonatas began to be published on their own, with their own unique opus numbers. Corelli's were so short that they had come in set to 12, but this had dwindled down to sets of three before the increased scope of sonata writing demanded individual publication. With Beethoven as a starting point, Romantic composers typically used complex networks of themes that utilized something called motivic unity, a technique where each theme has some kind of relationship, be it obvious or hidden, to every other theme. The advantage of using motivic unity is it allowed your key relationships to get more ambitious, and it allowed your themes to differ wildly in their emotional affect and musical texture while still assuring that your piece is going to hold together because there's some thread of music that holds all of your themes together, makes them into one coherent piece. This concept led to something that Arnold Schoenberg called developing variation. Schoenberg pinned that technique on Brahms, but it really defined the whole of the Romantic era. The development section that Beethoven had let out of its box now was threatening to bring all the movements of the sonata together. The retransition and the recapitulation were all but annihilated as composers found ways around a verbatim return of material. And they toyed with all sorts of expectations, more so than Beethoven could ever dream of. The medio sejura is, as Davis points out, a common space for the romantic sonata composer to digress into musical material that does not fit a forward-driving mold. Denying a sonata exposition this opportunity for forward advance, Davis writes, suppresses its classical teleology in one of the most expressively marked of all possible ways. Individual movements as self-contained pieces of music, with breaks in between, began to break down. First came the return of the ataka practice from the early sonatas da chiesa, where slow movements transitioned directly into fast ones. 
one might expect, this trick was soon adopted into pieces that looked like sonatas, but the ataka technique turned them into essentially one-movement pieces. Composers like Schubert and Schumann typically chickened out of calling these pieces sonatas. They preferred to call them fantasias. One exception in this time is Felix Mendelssohn's sister, Fanny Hensel, who had the guts to call one of these pieces a sonata. But the quintessential example from this era is Franz Liszt's Sonata in B minor, a walloping landmark of romantic composition with, to this day, no analytical consensus on how the piece works. It's a half hour of unbroken music and can be interpreted both as a huge sonata form movement as well as a whole four movement sonata in its own right. In Stephen Vandemortella's book Two Dimensional Sonata Form, he defines this form as different movements of a sonata cycle combined within one single movement sonata form. You might be surprised to learn that it's only in the last 50 years or so that scholars have been taking a serious look at pieces like Liszt's B minor sonata to really figure out how that piece works. The Liszt sonata was not a bolt out of the blue. He didn't invent all of these things all at once. There had been a gradual buildup of these techniques which emerged in its full first flowering in Liszt's B minor sonata. There were plenty of precedents for a piece like this, including Schubert's Wanderer Fantasy and Schumann's Fourth Symphony. But two-dimensional form isn't without its pitfalls. Identifying the finale of the sonata cycle with a recapitulation of the overarching sonata form, writes Van de Mortella, is one of the major difficulties the composer of a two-dimensional sonata form has to confront. Because a recapitulation is, by definition, a more or less similarly organized return of the exposition, the movement with which it is identified will be very similar to the movement that was identified with the exposition earlier on. Yet an essential characteristic of the relationship between a first movement and a finale in a sonata cycle is, of course, that they differ from each other. Romantic composers before Liszt had experimented with modifying the recapitulations to capture the spirit of the recap's function in the musical discourse while avoiding an exact repeat, to various levels of success. The same impulse gave rise to what's called cyclic form. And to see how, we're going to have to look at a couple of pieces written less than 100 years apart. First, Beethoven's Pathétique Sonata, an early work in the then standard three movements that, aside from their standard key relationships from C minor, A flat major to C minor within the three movements, don't really sound like they've got a whole lot to do with one another. The piece begins with a slow introduction that contains this melodic cell. On its own, nothing special. But in the second and third movements, there's the same melodic idea again, warped and twisted and hidden as though it may be. Hidden relationships like these might very well be something we notice without realizing that we notice it. This is a piece in multiple movements that are distinct from one another, so it's different from two-dimensional sonata form. It's not as though Beethoven's trying to make the second movement the development and the third movement the recapitulation. Cyclic form is an outgrowth from the same impulse that gave us the two-dimensional sonata, but there is a difference. I'd argue that cyclic pieces generally tend to be a little bit more obvious. In truly cyclic works, you know what the composer is doing. The second piece that I want to talk about is a much more classic example of cyclic composition, César Franck's 1886 Sonata for Violin and Piano. Motivic unity in the pathétique is hidden and not immediately obvious even if you're listening for it. But in Franck, when the same materials return across movements, boy howdy do you know what he's doing. Itself blurs the line between motivic unity, which French composers of Franck's era really liked, and quotation, the practice of inserting a bit of one movement into another. After the end of the Romantic era, around World War I, there ceased to be a defining ism for Western music, and the sonata fractured into various styles and regions. One early approach to the end of Romanticism was neoclassicism, 
an intentional, ironic throwback to the aesthetics of the Baroque and early Classical eras. Really should be called Neo-Baroque, but that's a pet peeve I have for another time. The Neoclassical Impulse, there weren't really Neoclassical composers, just composers who had Neoclassical eras, was to look back at older music as a mold or as a model. And many composers were touched by it in different ways. Paul Hindemith wrote sonatas for himself to play and published them in large sets, much as they had been in the late Baroque or early Classical, in a rejection of the passionate emotional expression of Romanticism. And when Igor Stravinsky wrote a piano sonata, he justified his title by citing the term's original meaning of a piece that was sounded. Anti-Romanticism, especially in France, was aligned with anti-Germanic sentiments, given the two countries, let's say, simmering tensions. So when Claude Debussy, at the end of his career, planned a set of six sonatas, he went back to Baroque and early classical models. Not just in how many would be grouped for publication, but in three movement structures that avoided sonata form and anything close to developing variation. Debussy only completed three sonatas of this Plan 6, with the most influential a sonata for flute, viola, and harp, which spawned a repertoire for that theretofore unheard of ensemble. The sonata thus expanded to include more than two instruments. Remember that original checklist of sonata characteristics from the very beginning of this video? One of the most significant works of the 20th century breaks the sixth of Schmidt Bestes' criteria. Since the old biblical sonatas of Kunal, it was incredibly rare for a composer to write a sonata with an explicit story behind it an explicit program, until Charles Ives' second piano sonata, The Conquered, a navigation of mid-19th century transcendentalist writers with Beethoven's fifth woven all throughout. Ives' sometimes rambling thoughts about the sonata were themselves the subject of a whole different publication, The Essays Before a Sonata. Ives inaugurated an American penchant for musical experimentalism later taken up by John Cage, whose sonatas and interludes for his trademark prepared piano offered a totally new range of timbres, clothed in a structure inspired as much by Scarlatti as Eastern philosophy. The existential threat to the sonata, and specifically to sonata form, was how you could adapt a form that's so heavily reliant on having different key areas to an era where tonality had broken down. If composers are writing atonal music, how could you possibly write a sonata? Well, the Concord sonata is mostly atonal, and Ives, in typically humble fashion, wrote that he called it a sonata because he didn't really have any other better word to describe what he had written. The sonata as a form had taken on such a grand historical weight that composers still used it as a litmus test for their musical chops. You had atonal composers who were still writing pieces in rough exposition, development, recapitulation formats. You're just losing the tonal battle between two different key areas that you would see in the classical era. But the structure still works, and so like we still use it even today. But the sonata, as a piece, tended to retreat back into an earlier definition. It's a piece of absolute music for a minimal number of instruments. There were some composers who attempted to modify this battle between key areas and adapt it into some facet of their own musical language. Take, for instance, the last five piano sonatas of Alexander Scriabin. Instead of key one versus key two across multiple sections, he would come up with two basic harmonies and pit them off against one another from the very outset, say a diminished chord and an augmented chord. The sonata's clear rooting in the past means that it is often a vehicle for contemporary composers who want to comment on the past or engage with the past in some way. And it often proposes contrasting ideas which are then set off against one another, and that dichotomous opposition is the driving force of the piece. Take, for instance, Elliot Carter's early piano sonata, which pits slow, stately material against a light, fast-moving figure free of any metric regularity. Mm -hmm. 
Older mid-century modernists used the historical reference and weight of the sonata as a provocative move. How else does one square the fact that the serialist arch polemicist Pierre Boulez wrote no fewer than three piano sonatas in his very limited output? Boulez's sonatas are an exception to the general rule that modernist, dissonant, avant-garde composers typically try to break with the past instead of bringing it along with them. Boulez especially as someone who said a lot of stuff about how the past should be destroyed. So this is the context for understanding why a composer like Brian Frenigo would choose to call a piece Sonatas for String Quartet. He's trying to engage with the past not only with the sonata tradition, but the separate string quartet tradition. I wanted to end this not with some grand summation, but rather with the subliminal, instinctive ways in which composers and those of us who are active in the art music world today understand what the sonata is. Because I didn't have to go through all of that to be able to tell you that the sonata is an important piece. You don't just call a piece a sonata just to be doing. You do it because you want to stake your claim to this grand tradition. It's a weighty and important genre. And I'll give you a story that illustrates this. About five years ago or so, I was starting to plan out what would be on my senior recital. I try to do things early, so a lot of my junior year I was thinking a little bit about this, and my professor at the time encouraged me for a, lo a long portion of my career, actually, while I was with him, to write a substantial piece, a significant piece of some kind. And he never would really expand upon what he meant by this. I think he didn't want to put any ideas in my head about what significant piece really meant. But I knew I wanted to have some kind of capstone in my senior recital. Not that it was a requirement to have one, but I had a bunch of these small pieces, you know, occasional songs here, uh, a piece written for an ensemble that came in over there, a piece for a friend, you know, all these short little pieces, typically, you know, four, five, six minutes long. And those weren't substantial. The canvas was simply not big enough. So when I knew that I was going to write this piece for my recital, I knew what it had to be. I knew that it was going to be a sonata for violin and piano before I knew anything other than who my violinist was going to be. Because I had a violinist friend who wanted a violin sonata and kept literally running into me in the hallways asking me when I would write the violin sonata. Shout out to Michelle, by the way. Even though it was premiered almost four years ago from the time that I'm recording this video, it's a piece that I think really holds up. I tend to think that my piece is are kind of garbage after a while. Like I tend to think that anything I've written over about a year ago is actually not all that good. But that's a piece that for many, many reasons I think really holds up. It's a piece that always has meant a lot to me and I'll link to a recording on it on the end screen. It'd mean a lot to me if you checked it out as well, if you haven't already.